When was it that you first realized you had a talent for maths if it wasn't at, at school as a child? Look, it, it didn't work somehow like that, right? No, it, was a, it was a school, public school, high school, a relatively small town in Canada just after the war where there was a shortage of teachers. The school leaving age was 15, mm -hmm. and a large number of people, after repeating grades once or twice, left school at the age of 15 and would work in the logging camp. Uh, and this was a, a natural thing to do. So it was every, you had every reason to think that what you might do. First of all, I, I met a young lady then who had a different birth, uh, vision of the world, I was probably influenced by her. You may interview her if you want. Uh, but, <laughs> she, <won. laughs> uh, what? she became your wife. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, was introduced to someone who had books left over from a socialist period in the 30s. And, and some of them were books about science. And one of them in particular is uh, about various famous scientists from the past. Mm -hmm. And that got you interested in science. But when did you realize that you had a real talent, a skill for mathematics, science and maths in particular? Well, I, I don't think I ever realized I had a real talent in mathematics. It's not like that. Uh, in other words, they did take IQ tests in the school. They didn't announce the results, but they took them. And, uh, so my so I have no idea what my IQ was. I suspect it was markedly larger than that of almost all the other students. Uh, so we had an English teacher, and this was, it was actually a really good English teacher, and we were introduced to a, a little bit of uh, English literature. And I, he gave me a book to read, and I read that, but my report was very bad. And then it just I didn't understand the meaning of reading and all. Uh, however, this, this teacher was, must have been aware of whatever score I was reaching on, the, uh, on these tests, that the standard test that they gave. And he took an hour of uh, school time to speak to me in front of all the other students and say, I should go to university. Wow, so it's because of this one teacher basically said, you are going to university. Well, it, as I said, I explained there were other influences yeah. and probably, you know, a natural... I mean, I, I may have had a natural penchant for these yeah. things, but he was the one who Encouraged you. made it clear to me that this was, a, this was a possibility. I had never thought of this possibility before that time. Interesting. So you went to um, the University of British Columbia. Yes. You studied uh, mathematics. And when did the, was there a moment when you thought, I love this subject, this is what I want to do? I never felt like that. <laughs> it's, not the way you, it's not the way you feel. Right? Uh, so I went, and they give you really, they give you tests, right aptitude tests, and uh, I, oh, I didn't do bad, badly, of course, with the aptitude tests for literature, but that was, but mathematics was stronger, and so I talked to the went to the as a beginning student, you talk to an advisor who could advise you what courses to take and so on. And there were standard courses. And he said, what do you want to do when you finish? Well, I said, I want to be a mathematician. I said, I want to be a physicist, that's right. See, uh, other sciences, of course, are difficult. I don't think you could become, say, a biologist or a chemist unless you have some previous insight into what biology is or, or chemistry is. And you really, it turned out, I think it's difficult if you don't have some previous conception of what it is to be a physicist. So, but with mathematics is not the case. It's just easy. Uh, so, <laughs> so in any in any case, he said, I, if I was going to be a mathematician or a physicist, I would have to. Well, first of all, at the time, life, you have to learn several languages. You can't be a mathematician. This is 1953, unless you know German, French, Russian, maybe even Italian. So I took that seriously, uh, and uh, then, then I took the standard courses. So when you say you took that seriously, you taught yourself in those languages for the purposes of becoming a mathematician. Let's see, you, pre you <laughs> pretend to teach yourself. <laughs> but I did take them seriously in the sense that, uh, and I would say I had, at that university, I had two different years, one second year and one second, fourth year, of instruction in Russian, and it was a very beautiful teacher, not beautiful, but she was a pleasant enough woman, young woman, but 
Right. So, you were studying mathematics. Um, in general, what areas of mathematics were you drawn to? What did you start to begin to I, I, I wanted to learn it all. You know what I was say? I mean, <laughs> if you want to be, I thought, and it's not so incorrect, that if you want to be a mathematician, you learn mathematics. Well, you also started to specialize. Um, you went to Yale to do your... Uh, no, it, it never occurred to me. I, I, I insist that no, it, it never occurred to me that I should specialize. It doesn't occur to me today. <laughs> so do, do you think maybe that is a reason why you are well-known, very famous, in fact, for joining kind of two areas of math because you don't actually see them as maybe different areas. You see math as an entirety rather than as different separate areas. Well, I haven't taken a survey of my colleagues, but I would think that a large number of mathematicians share my view that, you, that mathematics is, is mathematics. There may be pressure from your dean or something to publish a lot, and then you focus. Right. But if you have any imagination, it's, it's just one subject. From the University of British Club, you went to Yale, and then you went to Princeton. And at Princeton, um, you started to mix with people from the Institute for advanced study, which is where you are now, including the Norwegian athlete Selberg, who you've once said that meeting him was your first professional contact with a really first-class mathematician, and it was an experience you'll never forget for this Norwegian audience. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your relationship with him and how he inspired you. It was the first conversation which I'd had with a really excellent mathematician who explained to me what he was doing. Now, I understood him because I had read at some point, just for my own music, um, amusement, basically, a book by two American authors, that doesn't matter, but a, a, a relatively advanced book on ordinary differential equations. Uh, eigenvalue problems on the half line. And, and that was obviously more or less the technique that Selfer was used. So it was used. So I understood Selfer because of a kind of random reading that had been done before, and in this case, not very long before. In 1966, yeah. you made kind of the, the greatest breakthrough in what historically well, seen, seen, seen as a breakthrough, which was a way to link two different areas of mathematics, the, the sort of number theory with the automorphic forms. And number theory and automorphic forms were linked, were linked far before, long before I was well, well, looking maybe at in, them. For a general audience, you can explain what the breakthrough was that, that you made, which has, is normally explained as linking these two areas. Uh, I, I don't know if I can explain it, but let me try to describe a certain situation. There was a there was sequence of problems in number theory related to the number theory that and those problems which Gauss had solved as the first step, almost the first step in his career. And people had worked in that uh, area and they developed it and over a, a whole century, more than a century, the, the, the latest uh, advancements were made above all by a Japanese named Takagi, but there are many Germans. And uh, in particular also a very famous name was Arten. So there was what is called the Oh, as appropriate to say, so the abelian case. Mm -hmm. Abelian case, you recognize the origin of the word abelian. Yes, from uh, our uh, level, obviously. Was, uh, we got it solved. It was a problem that Takagi solved. But there was the remaining more difficult problem of a non abelian theory. Uh, basically, people had, so this was a problem that was high, that was very much in the, at, at the front of uh, Arton's. Uh, questions, are Arden's rather mathematical ambitions, and he had basically thrown in the towel. He said, it probably doesn't exist. We're not going to, we're ever going to learn anything more. And this eventually makes, gets you to the breakthrough, where you make these conjectures, yes. essentially creating the, the case that Arden the, threw in the towel, that you uh, managed to basically prove it for him. What, what I want to insist upon is this, this the mathematician whom I just spoke, Bachner, mm -hmm. who said to me one day in mid-August or late August that I was to teach a course on the material, the classical material which I've just explained. Right. And I said, well, I can't do that because I don't know anything about it and there's only a week left. <laughs> 
And he said, no, you're going to do it. So I gave in. So because of him and because of his pressure, I, what I wanted to explain was that as soon as I came to Clinton and talked about a certain topic, he, he said to me, you must do this and this and this. And I, I basically followed, I didn't follow all of suggestions, but I followed all of them, and so he was pushing me further over. And, and this led to you making a breakthrough, which is the Langlands Conjectures, which has yeah, ultimately yeah. Uh, resulted in the Langlands Program, which is a, a kind of collective mathematical project to prove your conjectures, which involves hundreds of mathematicians over the last 50 odd years, um, paraphrasing very quickly because we've only got a few minutes left. Well, how, how do you feel about having given rise to such an incredible project that people say has changed the um, direction of mathematics? <laughs> In 30 seconds. <laughs> I, don't, I don't pay much attention to those people. <laughs> well, how do you look when you look back at the conjecture that you made? the beginnings of the conjecture that you made in the 1960s, and you see how the field has changed. What are your feelings about how mathematics has, has come since then and your influence within it? I know it's a big question, but we're running out of time. <laughs> it's best not to think of such things. One, one other question. Um, the Arbor Prize is also to stimulate young mathematicians into enjoying taking up mathematics. If you had a message for a young mathematician, about the subject, what would it be? Um, you, you mentioned well, beautiful, bad, lofty uh, things. Well, that's an embarrassing question, but the, the obvious answer is be careful whom you listen to. <laughs> <laughs> Explain. Well, I, I said, I, I said, Faulkner put a certain pressure on me, and that was very valuable. Uh, I had a conversation with Selberg that was very valuable. But by and large, I did what I wanted to. And uh, I think that's the, that's the best thing to do. Do what you want to do.